Good afternoon and a very warm welcome to the Festival of Politics 2021. I'm Claire Adams, an MSP. I'm convener of the Constitution, Europe, External Affairs and Culture Committee. I would like to welcome you all to this special online edition of the Festival of Politics in partnership with the Parliament's think tank, Scotland's Future Forum. This afternoon's panel is titled Why Culture is Key to Good Health and Wellbeing and is held in partnership with the Edinburgh International Culture Summit Foundation. We are delighted that many people are able to join us online today, and I look forward to hearing your comments and questions as we get into our discussion. So, How is, important is culture in the health and well-being of society? Thanks to a growing body of clinical and neurological research, there is increasing evidence that participation in cultural activity offers revolutionary benefits for a range of medical conditions, from dementia and singing to Parkinson's disease and dance. The social and economic benefits of arts and health care are still being explored and understood by policymakers, the public and the medical community. So, Exactly how powerful are the arts and culture in addressing society's health and well-being? This panel aims to address these issues in the next 60 minutes, so do stay with us and enjoy. We are delighted that you are able to join us and take part, and I would encourage you all to use the event chat function to introduce yourselves, if you could put your first name and your geograph geographical location and pose any questions you would like for the panel. I am absolutely delighted to be joined today by David Leventhal, Programme Director, Dance for PD, and former member of the Mark Morris Dance Group, Sarah Munro, the director of Baltic Gateshead, who has over 20 years' experience of cultural leadership. She is also a board member of Scotland's Futures Forum. And Professor Raymond MacDonald, Professor of Music, Psychology and Improvisation at Edinburgh University. He is also a chartered health psychologist and also a saxophonist and composer. There will be an opportunity for our online audience to put questions and views through the event. If you would like to make a contribution, enter them in the question and answer box and make sure to state your name and where you are this afternoon. I think that has been covered twice in the script that I have in front of me. Sorry. I would like to begin now by asking each of our panellists to summarise, and this is my first prompt of the day, concisely where possible, how you would summarise the respect and importance that arts and culture currently command in the world of health and well-being in the UK and further afield. And may I ask Sarah if you could outline your thoughts first, please? Certainly. Hello, and thank you for um, having me here today. It's really good to join you all um, from Gateshead. I'm slightly outside the Scottish borders, but not very far. Um, you'll have to slightly forgive me. I've just come out of a very horrible, fluey, chesty coffee thing, so um, I hope this, it, it feels quite unusual for me just to be speaking out loud. But to be precise and concise, I started working in the arts um, almost 25, if not slightly more, years ago. And actually, the very my, my first sort of deep foray into work was with, was in Edinburgh, and it was within an organisation called ArtLink. And we worked then in some of with some of the most marginalised communities within Edinburgh's already marginalised communities, so working with people with quite significant experiences of disability, of mental health concerns, and of um, long-term health needs. And one of the very earliest interventions I got involved on was when, at the height of the AIDS crisis with the AIDS and HIV, and we there was clear evidence then of the importance of building responses that involved creative participation to support people's health and well-being. So right back in the days of the first milestone house when it was built in Edinburgh, um, a facility that's no longer required, thank goodness, it has been something that has been recognised and embedded. And we've seen increased over the years of working in that front line of the practice of arts. We've really seen that significant impact. We've seen real specialism develop, particularly around things like Alzheimer's and music, around dance, and around visual creative, 
participation. But what I suppose I want to, my, in my trying to be precise and concise, one would also say, though, that it has not nearly gone far enough. And I think that's that we've seen this evidence. There is bodies and bodies of evidence. There are theses and PhDs. And we're now at a stage where even Public Health England in 2016 started published a report to try and provide that framework to show we could show what the evidence was. Because any of us who do it and see it and witness it on that front line can absolutely are convinced and can see that it's transformative in many, many ways. And I suppose for me, the the I mean the quote just quickly from Public Health England here back in 2016 mm -hmm. that they were convinced the arts had the great potential to contribute to integrated person-centered health and social care that the arts can be used for prevention to support independent living and to meet the physical mental and social needs of those with long-term health care I think for me I would go even further and for me and, and it's particular. I think we've begun to articulate quite clearly where it can help with very particular mental um, or, or, or physical health problems, illnesses. But I think where we now need to see a significant investment and an increase in the way that we're, we're, we're sort of trusting what arts can do is around young people and mental health. And I think it's the public health um, concern that, that, for me, that is most. Um, pushing and challenging at the moment and one that needs to really enable us to bring and focus more arts and activity into building because we have got real proof that that reduces anxiety that it creates social connectivity that it builds people's social cultural capital and aligns with a lot of those the the, the kind of social um and confidence building that's required at the basis of any great society so for me the arts and healthcare is fundamentally needs to be invested not just for the individual but actually for the good of our communities the health of our communities and even further the health of our societies so i see it as being something that's actually required as a fundamental for democracy where do we come together to listen to understand to build awareness of others we do that those through active participation in classes, workshops, programmes, activities, but also through that very quiet, contemplative, going to the museum, looking at that object, sitting in front of that painting, slowing ourselves down. And there's so much evidence around all of that that in my book, yes, we've gone a long way, but I would like to see creativity and cultural participation being utterly embedded across every single department of government for the challenges we have of the next 10 years. So far as to say they're also very low carbon or can be done in a very low carbon way. But there's a few areas of, that I, I'm very interested in around, around there. Yeah, thank you, Sarah. Um, ticking all the government boxes there about what, what the, the key issues are going forward. Um, so could I bring in David next, please? Sure. And uh, thank you uh, so much for having me here. And Sarah, thank you for your really thoughtful and compelling words. I, I think uh, to, to add to Sarah's comments, uh, I want to acknowledge that the, the sort of traditional viewpoint is that health and well-being lives within the domain of healthcare. And healthcare provision, and is the primary responsibility of uh, of medical professionals. And I think over the past um, twenty years, we've started to see a shift in which uh, healthcare professionals are acknowledging that they they can't do it alone. We're starting to see some real demographic challenges in how um, the in in many cases the conditions related to mental health. Which are, uh, which are dramatically increased, of course, by the pandemic, as well as conditions related to aging. We are all living longer, which is a, which is a good thing. Um, but our healthcare system and networks, wherever we are, whether you're talking about the uh, NHS or the American model, I'm based in New York, uh, we, are, we are strained to, to uh, deal comprehensively with issues related to aging, whether that's neurodegenerative conditions, physical conditions, uh, mental health, social isolation. Um, and so even within healthcare, there is a realization that we can't go it alone. We need to build partnerships. And the most obvious choice in those partnerships is those working in, in arts and culture. Um, because I think even in healthcare, there's a realization that it's not just about 
what's the matter with me. It's also about what matters to me. And for many of us around the world, what matters to me is art and my culture, whatever that is, and um, a sense of connection to others. And so I would say that the UK and Scotland in particular has emerged as a leader in envisioning ways that policy uh, can incorporate arts and culture into health and well-being. Uh, part of that is through social prescribing. Some of it is through other policy changes. Some of it is through creating reports like public health. And also the uh, World Health Organization Europe came out with a report in 2019 that did a summary of research in the area of arts, health, and, and well-being. Um, and, and really made a, a compelling argument for more provision. But, um, but there is a long way to go. And uh, I, I think one, of the, one way to look at this is to understand that, uh, in my view at least, arts and culture is to health and well-being what solar power is to a livable planet. So it's abundant, it's everywhere, we are as humans, but we have to figure out a better way to tap that energy, to tap arts and culture in the service of health and well-being. We know it's there. We know the research shows that it's effective. We need more research. Um, and we, we need to figure out better ways to, to tap that incredible resource that's all around us uh, to create a more sustainable health infrastructure so that uh, the issues I talked about earlier, mental health, uh, issues of aging, neurodegenerative disease, are are better addressed. And overall, we're promoting a better quality of life. Okay. And finally, Raymond, thank you. Oh, thanks. Thanks very much. I think I would just like to e echo both, you know, Sarah and, and David's points and, and emphasize that there's now unequivocal evidence that cultural engagement has an absolutely fundamental, important role in our life and also an important effect on, on our health and well-being. Um, we, we are all creative. We are all musical. Every human being has a biological and social guarantee of musicianship. And that's not a vague utopian ideal. You know, we look at the neurological evidence, we could look at the psychological evidence and the cultural evidence. And it all points to this fact that to be creative, to engage in culture is a defining part of our humanity. It creates community, it bonds us together, and we express what it means to be human by being creative and by, by working together. A couple of examples. The, the earliest communication between a newborn baby and its parent is essentially musical and improvisational. Um, Colin Trevartan's work at Edinburgh University showed through very fine-grained microanalysis of how a baby bonds with its new, with its parent, that the, the, the movements are musical, the movements are rhythmic, they're dance-based, they have more in common with music than with natural language. And so the earliest and most important bonding relationship of our life is partly musical and improvisational and, and dance-based. The patterns of interaction laid down in those early weeks and months will influence for the rest of our, the rest of our lives. And they're essentially musical. A parent interacts with their new baby creatively and, improvise, and improvisationally. And it's fascinating that, in many respects, many people will say, I love music, but I'm not musical. You know, I love art, but I can't paint. I love dance, but I can't dance. And I think one of the challenges that we have is to empower people, to make people feel that they are creative, to um, change people's identities, to create healthy cultural identities, healthy cultural creative identities, so that everybody feels that they can engage in culture and everybody feels that they can engage, engage in music. So the relationship between cultural engagement and our sense of self and, and who we are is, is very important. Even if we think about how we, we, we listen to music, it's also an incredibly powerful way of maintaining our mood and maintaining our health. You know, we can now access an infinite array of music at any point in the day. But when we decide, what do I want to listen to? What music do I want to listen to? We make a number of very sophisticated and highly complex psychological assessments. How do I feel right now? How do I want to feel in five minutes? 
who's going to be listening to my music? Am I listening to it by myself on the bus? Am I in my bedroom with my friends? Is this a party? What music is going to meet those psychological and social needs? And what's incredible is we do that very quickly and very sophisticatedly. So we're all engaging with music and we're all engaging with music and health and a number of um, very sort of sophisticated and very efficient ways. So in that sense, we're all musical because we're all using music every day in a way to, to engage with music. But also, we can all learn to express ourselves through mu mu music, music as well. We can all learn to engage culturally with, 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 with mu music and dance. And I think these are challenges for um, our education system, for our healthcare, for our healthcare system to create healthy cultural identities, healthy creative identities, so that we all feel that we can engage in these in these in these activities. And I think as both Sarah and David have said, we'll, we'll, research has made huge advances over the past 20 or 30 years. There's been a revolution in research technology from brain imaging technology that can now show, and I'm quoting Peter Fox, the director of neurology at San Antonio University in Texas. He says, the whole brain lights up like a Christmas tree when we're engaged in music. It's no longer just particular parts of the brain that we used to think were involved in the music. When we're engaged culturally, our limbic system, our frontal cortex, the whole brain is engaged in, in, in cultural and in cultural engagement. So these research advances are providing more evidence to show that the importance that cultural engagement has in music. And I think in terms of thinking of this as a festival of politics, there, there's, 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 there's political issues for us to, to engage with as well in terms of increasing access and making sure that people can express themselves and engage fully with, with, with cultural activities. Hey, that, that's, that's wonderful. Thank you. Um, of course, the First Minister um, did a TED talk uh, a while ago about um, the ambition for a well-being society in Scotland and the programme for gov government. We see that mentioned many, many times, and, and talking about the mainstreaming of, of culture across different um, government areas. Uh, I wonder if it would be helpful for the audience, uh, and certainly for myself, if we could hear some specific examples of what might happen. I am aware of um, a choir that has been done with people with COPD, which has helped their lung function and improved their mental health as a result of that. So, if, if we could hear here's some specific examples, I think that might be quite helpful. I'm, I'm going to go to David first, obviously, with your project um, and Parkinson's disease in particular. Sure. Uh, so, the uh, the Dance for PD, Dance for Parkinson's Disease program, started at the Mark Morris Dance Center in Brooklyn, New York. 20 years ago, and the goal was really very simple. It was to share uh, the experience and knowledge that professional dancers had gained in their training and in their process of performing with uh, people living with Parkinson's and their families. Uh, the goal really wasn't to create a, a therapy experience. It was to engage this community in the arts. As uh, Professor McDonald said, it, it was so much about uh, harnessing what individuals already had in them as musical beings, as creative beings, as physical beings, even though they were living with um, with a, a, a challenge, physical challenge, uh, they they were able to tap into their own creativity and their own imagination in the service of movement. And so, one of the objectives of this program was really to well, I would say it's a double-edged sword. On the one hand, we we wanted it to be sort of a journey out of the medicalized identity, out of someone feeling that they were living as a patient, and to invite them into the realm of living as an artist, living as a dancer, um, living in this creative space, and to not think about Parkinson's at all. But as we started to evolve the program, what we realized is that everything that dancers do in their training, and this applies also to musicians and other artists, uh, Everything that dancers do is is applicable to something that is starting to change or go away in Parkinson's. So when you look at Parkinson's as you know a challenge of automaticity, for example, people with Parkinson's have difficulty doing everyday movements like walking or turning. Dance dancers uh, need to think very consciously about all of those motor skills. We need to practice them. We use we need to use imagery and music 
to uh, strategically approach physical challenges that come up in the choreography. And so that sort of relationship, that corollary between what dancers do and what people with Parkinson's need to live well became really clear to us within two, and th two to three years. And that helped us design the, the approach and the curriculum that we still use today. And that has been shared with communities all over the world. There are versions of the original Brooklyn program now in more than 25 countries around the world. Uh, what's remarkable to me is, is not so much the spread of that, but the fact that in each of those places where a Dance for Parkinson's class exists, it is reflective of the local, individual, cultural traditions, music, dance styles that are native to that place. Uh, so it's not so much that, you know, this particular form of dance, whether that's ballet or modern or musical theater, which is what we focus on in New York, that this particular form of dance is helpful for this population. It is that dance and music and community are vital ingredients to uh, people with Parkinson's who are, who are trying to live with dignity, um, to improve their motor skills, and to build a sense of connection. And that works as well in New York as it does in Edinburgh, as it does in Pune, India, as it does in Beijing, as it does in Sydney. Um, because the model is the same, it's the content that, that has flexibility and changes. So I, I think to, to sum up, um, the idea that we started with 20 years ago has, is unchanged, and that is that it's the artistic nature of what we do that is applicable and is beneficial to people with Parkinson's. As soon as we start to pull away and treat it as, uh, as solely as therapy or as um, a medical intervention, we lose the, the sauce that makes it beneficial. And we've seen this in the research. We've seen research projects that, that try to uh, desiccate the, the artistic nature of that experience. Um, and what we found is, as, as Professor McDonald said, when we think about the brain, the regions of the brain lighting up when we listen to music, we want that effect in the class. And that happens when people are engaged in an artistic experience, uh, not so much when they're thinking of this as a, as a clinical intervention. So we've, we've tried to maintain that. And, and again, also pulling away from the idea that dance is only about exercise, because I think we in dance have this, uh, you know, we have to uh, really defend the fact that, it, yes, there are elements of physical exercise embedded in all dance forms, but first and foremost, dance is an art form. It is expressive, it is imaginative, it is creative, um, it is musical, and it is integrative uh, in terms of bringing all those elements together in the service of, of expression. So, um, yes, we certainly say that there are el the elements of, of Physical exercise are embedded within dance, but it's so much more. And it's that so much more that really provides the physical, social, cognitive, and emotional benefits for people living with Parkinson's. Thank you. I'm, go I'm going to come to, to um, Professor McDonald again, Raymond, particularly um, as someone who, who maybe has been involved in desiccating a few of these issues over the years. If you could maybe give us some, some examples of the projects that you, you feel have been particularly uh, influential. Sure, Claire, I'd be delighted to. So, I mean, w w one of the projects that I work in is, is with a, a Glasgow based organisation called Limelight. And we were involved in work. Oh, I, sorry, Raymond, I've lost your sound. I don't know if it's just me. Can everyone else hear Raymond? Um, I wonder if I wonder if Raymond's been somehow put on mute. I, I think what we'll do is is, is I'll, I'll I'll jump to Sarah at the moment. If somebody could, if the moderator could maybe message Raymond, let him know we can't hear him at the moment. And I invite Sarah to, to, I know if Sarah already gave us an example of the project in Edinburgh, the um, AIDS project, but I wonder if she could um, uh, just give us another example of, of something happened more recently. Of course, yes. I'll, I'll, I'll jump in until we get Raymond back. Um, and actually, I'm going to pull, uh, uh, just because David's example was so fantastic and around almost that kind of coming towards the end of life, ageing. 
And one of the and with a long trajectory. So I'm going to talk about something that has a tiny trajectory because we just started it in 2020. Um, but it's working with babies, 20 babies for 2020. That this is again, it's it's some of those very similar principles, and we were very concerned. And actually, if you're okay, I'm going to read a couple of very short quotes just about statistics that um, were informing our thinking a year ago. Um, and it was particularly, um, we have a lot of children and young people surrounding the institution that I lead here in Newcastle Gateshead. And some of the statistics that were coming through as a result of COVID, our children and young people, particularly those, and this is a big issue for us about where, if we want to improve the benefits of society, we need to absolutely look at the equity, we need to level up really for, for some of our poorest, most disadvantaged communities, when we're talking about any kind of work. So I include that when we're focusing on well-being. So our children and young people, are, particularly those living in poverty, have been disproportionately affected by COVID-19. And with little recourse to influence or change, they ex they've experienced quite catastrophic impact. So here's just two quotes. A quarter of pupils, now that's roughly 2.5 million children in the UK, had no schooling or tutoring during lockdown. 74% of those at private schools had full days of teaching, and we will all be very aware that our private schools are not cutting back on their arts education. They are increasing it and increasing the investment, but um, had full days teaching, and the proportion was only 38% of state pupils. Now, this is across the whole of the UK. Um, these diminished educational and economic prospects compounded the burden of the pandemic on young people's mental health and well-being. In July 2020, the Mental Health and Young People Survey included over 3,500 participants between the ages of 5 and 22 and found that 16 had a probable mental disorder, which had increased from 11 per cent the year before the pandemic. So what we are seeing is a very significant increase. One in 10 young people aged 11 to 22 said that they often or always felt lonely, and 30 per cent reported sleep problems. Now, as a basis for our young people going forward, whether it's in to contribute to the economy, to provide positive citizenship, to contribute in all sorts of ways, that mental health piece for us has become a very important critical piece of work within this well-being. And so two projects that we've been doing over the last wee while, and one was our 20 babies. So we took 20 parents or carers who had had children, young uh, babies during lockdown or just before lockdown, where we could see that there was a significant impact of that isolation, not passing the baby around the community, not sharing the conversation, and not having as much integrated play. And so we've just started a year long. And what's been really fascinating is, and it is absolutely based on that, we have two researchers from the, the university embedded in the partnership with us. We've got a private company actually who works on product design for um, for babies for for creative products, and there's a quite a significant piece of work going on to try and really understand how what difference it makes by build, bringing people together. And what we found in these situations, it's the combination of the creative, a really clear framework for the creative practice and the participation, but with a very clear framework for understanding their sort of social and well-being piece. So we've started to align a lot of the work we're doing now with children and young people, very similar, building their social connections, building their social networks. And we use a very simple framework, which is the NHS Five Steps to Wellbeing, because we've found that one that a lot of people can pick up on. And whatever groups we're collaborating and however we're building civic partnerships, lots of different partners can understand the outputs that you, co you contribute together. So that's about how people feel and how they're able to function almost. So the feeling and the function is sitting. So it's very much looking at the difference that the arts makes to self-esteem, to confidence, to their individual value and their worth. And it can be defined through things like acts of kindness that come as a result of people being able to be in these kinds of participatory. So basically, through, uh, through getting the knowledge and the skills and the kind of networks, how are they then empowered to help their own lives and help those lives of others? And what we are seeing is whether it's babies with their carers or their parent, or whether it's young people in their networks with each other, that these things are profoundly enhanced through the experience of using the arts. And so this is where I feel now is the time to really increase how we're, we're, we're really focusing on this. And particularly, you can take it through to, to education also, 
where we see that we know a lot of children, particularly those with some more neurodiverse or slightly autistic um, experiences, struggle with a lot of mainstream education and can feel very isolated from the learning environment. Put them into a creative class with the same kinds of learning outcomes, and they'll, they'll, they'll perform very, very differently. So, right across the piece, this investment in, in creative um, access is, is, I think, really quite an, a critical part of how we, we, we kind of build back um, our society. Thank you, Sarah. I'm going to hopefully get back to Raymond today. Yeah, so oh. how's that? Oh, can you, very, can you hear yes. me? Uh, working about, sorry, don't know what, what happened there. So, um, But yeah, I, I'd like to give a, yeah, a, a, a couple of examples. One one of the, the projects that I'm involved in is with a Glasgow-based company called Limelight, who specialise in working with all sorts of people from, from dis disadvantaged groups. And in one of our projects, we worked with people who had mild or moderate learning difficulties, and they were involved in percussion workshops aimed at playing a Javanese gamelan. And over the course of a six-month period, um, what we were able to quantify people's musical skills and people's communication skills and their levels of self-esteem. And what we were able to show was that being involved in, in these percussion workshops significantly enhanced people's musical skills. So the people involved in the workshops got better musically, rhythmically. But very importantly, there was a resultant development in communication skills. So as well as developing musically, there was also a psychological development. And that psychological development stretched to people feeling better about themselves and how they expressed themselves. And then subsequent research where we interviewed people to ask about what did it mean to be involved in musical activities showed that, and this goes back to one of David's points earlier, that it was the it wasn't the the, the, necessarily the, the, the clinical objectives, the clinical aspects of the work were important, but it was involving people in a holistic experience where people were um, engaged socially, they were engaged musically, they felt they were getting better at playing music, they got opportunities to perform in public. The, the whole cultural experience was very important for this group of people with learning difficulties who were involved in the percussion workshops. And a, a, a second example, which involved this time listening to music, um, another project I was involved in, we asked people who were coming into hospital for a minor operation on their foot to listen to their favourite music. And that was very important. We wanted them to listen to their favourite music. We wanted to know what sort of music they listened to and how often they listened to it after the operation. And what we found was that when we compared a group of people who were listening to their favourite music after the operation in comparison to a group who weren't listening to any music, people who listened to their favourite music felt less anxious in the hospital environment. And we, and we subsequently showed not only would people feel less anxious, but when they listened to their favourite music in a laboratory setting, they also felt less pain. So, listening to your music reduced your levels of pain and it reduced your levels of anxiety. And we suggested that the reason for that was that when you're listening to your favourite music, you're emotionally engaged. You're emotionally engaged with something that's very personally meaningful for you, and you're also possibly distracted. Um, so, listening to music as well as engaging in music has both clinical and psychological and educational educational benefits. Coming right up to date. There was another project that I was involved in with a group called the Glasgow Improvisers Orchestra. And um, during when lockdown started, and we were all locked in our in, in our houses, and physically physically isolated, we attempted to communicate online musically and say, well, can we get together once a week and play and play music together? And what we anticipated was that this would just be a social thing. We would just get together once a week, and it would just be a way of chatting with your friends and maybe playing some music. But what we quickly found was that this became a very important way of staying connected with our community. And, and, and the, the, the group that met grew to over 100 people from around the world. And um, we started a research project where we began to interview people about their experiences of playing music online, of improvising online. And what we found was that when we talked to people, um, they 
frequently said that playing music online reduced their sense of isolation, enhanced their mood during a very difficult, a very difficult period, and also from a creative point of view, helped them make new creative, creative breakthroughs. And we took some of that, some of those developments, and then um, got. I was involved in a transatlantic music education, music therapy project where. Um, tutors from Limelight in Glasgow worked with the Centre for Music Therapy in Austin, Texas, with people with quite severe neurological illnesses, and they created a band, a transatlantic band, where they wrote songs together and recorded these songs. And once again, we were able to show the positive social and psychological benefits of engaging in, 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 in creating a, a sort of pop band together. But what was also fascinating was that this was done remotely, and it, it came out of the, pan, the pandemic, if you like. And it also points to the fact that music has such an important role in our identity as well. Because when we interviewed people about their experience, they talked about, oh, when I write a song, I can express how I'm feeling, I can express my preferences, I can express my likes. And also, when I'm writing a song with other people, I feel part of a group, I feel part of, of my, but I'm with my, I'm with my friends. And these friendships can be established remotely, remote, remotely as well. So I'm aware. I, I, I could rant and rave about the projects that I've been involved in for quite for quite a while. So that's two or three examples of some of some of the work the work that I'm involved in. But I'll yeah, I should maybe stop talking. Thank thank you. Um, I'm I'm also very conscious um, that we haven't had many questions from the audience. So I know there's a, a quite a large number of people on the call this afternoon. So if you could if you have any questions at all, please use the Q and A section, and they'll be fed back in. You to the panel, and um, uh, I'm all trying to get through as many of the audience um, questions as possible this afternoon. Um, so it, it's really um, wonderful to hear all, all of these uh, examples and the, the, the work that you're doing. And um, as someone who's, who's not from this background at all, but you know has experienced um, this through, through my work as an MSP over the years, it, 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 I have seen a. a a step change, if you like, in people's attitudes towards it, which I hope is is starting to filter through. Um, I'm also aware, three years ago, of NHS Lanarkshire, my home home area, had uh, put on a concert, and it was the medical staff and the people who worked there who were the performers on that evening, and we had cultures from all over the world. It was wonderful, wonderful experience. So, so certainly the staff understood um, what it did for their own well-being, and we had um, a, an NHS choir. In Lanarkshire form over COVID as well. So all these these get examples. So um, when we're hearing this, what are the barriers still to actually the acceptance that this needs to be further mainstreamed and 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 what exists? And obviously, I'm going to go to David first because he he maybe give us examples of what's worked, um, you know, from a New York perspective, and then then to hear. Um, how Raymond and Sarah both feel that, that, that we need to change that that attitude to to make it more mainstream. So, if I go to David first, please. Sure, I think there are three three types of barriers that we see in our work. The first is the the perception from the community that the arts and the dance in particular are off limits, that are they're only for elites, they're only for people who've danced before. Um, all of which is a, is a, a misconception, clearly. But but I think this has evolved over many decades of perhaps goodwilled messaging from arts organizations themselves. You say, you know, come see our performances. You come see our incredible company perform, and that only reinforces the sense that oh, I could never do that. Those people are on stage, and and I'm very far removed. I think we have seen great changes in the last 20 years in terms of uh, inclusion equity and uh, accessibility in the arts, that uh, it's not enough to, to put on a show. We need to engage audiences in different ways and really redefine the term of who an audience is. In our, in our vocabulary, an audience is somebody who comes to a dance for Parkinson's class. It's a, a young person who comes to a special class for kids living uh, on the autism spectrum. So those are audiences too. It's not just about getting people into the theater. And, and that's a critical change that needs to be made from the arts organization side uh, in terms of creating programming that really uh, involves the, the full spectrum of the community in that artistic process. Uh, 
the, the second is so that's the, the perception from the public that this is off limits. The second is I think the the idea that um, that medical professionals uh, somehow feel uh, separated from the arts that they they feel perhaps even a bit guilty about referring people to uh, artistic programs or interventions because it seems separate from what they do as opposed to a, an essential part of the overall prescription. Um, we have challenged that dramatically by inviting neurologists and medical professionals to the class to see the class for themselves. Uh, this was particularly important before there was the wealth of research literature that we have now. Uh, you know, 15 years ago, there really wasn't a lot of literature on the impact of dance and Parkinson's or arts and other other aspects of health. And so we had to bring people in to, to see it, to believe it. And I will say that made a significant difference when you include medical professionals in that process, when you invite them in to see what's actually happening, there's a, there's a real world recognition uh, because they see their own patients uh, walking and moving and interacting very differently than they do in their in their offices and and that's that's a fundamental shift and i think the third is related to that and that that pertains to research uh the barrier that medical professionals have in referring people to programs like dance for pd or, or many of the programs that that raymond was talking about uh relate to a compelling body of research that is uh at least getting close to what scientists perceive as the gold standard. We'll never get to the gold standard because you can't do double blind testing in arts. You can't, you either know you're in a dance class or you're not. <laughs> so there, there isn't really that sort of placebo pill. However, we can, we can certainly increase the rigor of scientific research as it pertains to, uh, to arts programs. And that includes imaging work. That includes, you know, larger cohorts. That includes really understanding the mechanisms for why these programs work. We know they work, but we can't always explain in scientific terms the the under the hood, I guess you say bonnet, under the bonnet uh, mechanisms for why they are working the way they do. So we need more work in that regard. But those those in my mind are the, are the three barriers. And the reason I'm so excited about this work is that I'm seeing progress in all three of those areas. I'm seeing more people. Um, recognizing that they can be included, that they are part of these artistic organizations and communities. I'm seeing medical professionals refer their patients more and more readily and passionately to these programs, uh, particularly when they've had a face-to-face -face interaction with those programs. And I'm seeing more rigorous long-term studies uh, on the impact of, of the arts on health. And, and one, one thing that's really interesting is that we're starting to see longitudinal studies. We just had a, there was a study done at York University in Toronto on the impact of a dance class uh, for people with Parkinson's over three years. That's a dramatic shift over the 10 to 12 week studies that we'd seen before. And what was even more encouraging is that the benefits were, uh, were astoundingly positive. So the degree of symptom impairment that you would see over three years in a regular cohort was dramatically uh, decreased in people who took a regular dance class. Again, it's not, it's not news to us because we see that every day in our work, but what's important is that it's, it's being studied and it's being published. And those results really do make an impact both on the medical side, but also on the participant side. When, you know, we don't want them to come in because it's good for them. We want them to come in because they want to engage in the arts. But it certainly helps make the case for why arts need to be a fundamental part of, of everybody's daily experience. Um, can I see that and then I'll come back to Raymond on this one. Thanks. Uh, yeah, David, I think just said that so succinctly and that seeing those barriers when you've worked in something over that kind of real sort of arc of a arc of a career path and seeing what things are improving. And I, I think it's fantastic that those things are, you know, we are beginning to see people refer more, be more include, include themselves. And I think one of the things that does work in our favour potentially at the moment is that so many people in lockdown had a fundamentally 
change their understanding of actually what that everyday participation in everyday culture was. And in this, I'm including gardening, I'm including, you know, cooking. And but people picked up the the crafting, they did the cutting and the gluing and the sticking and the making and the walking and the. I didn't quite do the cooking piece, but I I did I did start gardening for the first time ever. And so I think well, there is a sort of fundamental thing that shifted. I think people do now see and understand. And I think so for me, it's a number of things. I think one, institutions, there's a big, there's a significant amount of funding through culture within cultural organizations that's invested that have an absolute huge capacity to support some of these really big challenges and work in a more aligned way with other parts of the civic body and the and you know whether it's at, from the parliamentary policy level through to to things within local communities so i think there's a fundamental shift that, in people's understanding of that value that is a positive i think the other things that, that in, in terms of the big the big question of the day around how do we decarbonize how do we create and how do we ensure social and environment, you know, within that, the, the, the social justice piece within that, so the equity piece within how we, we include and engage as we decarbonise and reduce that extreme. So I think there are the, the conversations. I mean, I would have to say in my head that probably one of the things you need to do is reform capitalism, you know, and I think, you know, there are. That's the, what do you need, Claire? We need to reform capitalism. But actually, if you are only going to value your citizens eat through the economic lens and not through the well-being and not through the social and not through the, 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 the much more that humanistic, holistic sense of who we are as people and how, you know, I remember getting a big argument a few years ago on stage with, with a politician, but I was like, we are so much more than our economic lives. But well, of course, we need jobs and we need to, but we are so much more than that. So I think there is something here that if we can understand that the bottom line is not about extracting up to some profit for a small number of people, but is a is a very different way of understanding what is economic investment. And I think that, you know, I, I'm very excited by the Scottish Parliament's approach to the wellbeing agenda. I think that does give us um a lot of potential opportunities. And we are seeing these changes. We are seeing even the DCMS at the moment is working with the Department of Trade and Industry to try and create a new matrix working with people around the world to understand how do you quantify joy and actually what is the economic value that can contribute to that so that we can win those investment articles, investment art um, arguments, not articles, into to creating more investment. I think the other thing we need is, um, again, that evidencing and articulation. And I think we all need to get better at being very concise with our language and how we communicate. I think sometimes the art world itself is not always the best at, in, at doing that. We can be, um, some are better than others. But I think that, and that listening and responding, really listening to our communities, understanding what it is that people really need. And I suppose for me, finally, it's about brave leadership, isn't it? It's at, because really to make the level of change we need, it can't just rely on that individual coming in to see that class, that arts professional, or that, that medical professional coming in to watch and sit through a, a session with 20 babies or a, an Alzheimer's dance troupe or whatever the, the, the thing is. It has to be scaled up more quickly than that. And that to me is about our, our political leaders really finding out and understanding and then being able to articulate and lead at the policy level the changes. Because I used to think we could change the world one taxi driver at a time, but we ain't got enough time to do it one taxi driver at a time. So actually these things do need to be scaled up. And I think that's where Scotland is in a very strong position to take some real global leadership on this very issue. So if I can ask Raymond to say, if he can, uh, uh, sort of concisely about some of the barriers, that would be great. Lots of questions in the in the in the uh, Q and A now, and I'm, I'm very conscious we're not got much time left. So I'll go to Raymond for that. Okay, I'll try. I'll try and be concise. I think uh, just to yeah echo what Sarah and David are saying. I think it's really, really important. So one of the big issues is we want to normalise creative engagement emphasise that everybody's creative. And I know that sounds like a, a sort of a, a glib statement, but so many people I talk to 
will agree about the importance of culture, but they'll say, oh, I'm not musical. My family aren't musical. I don't have, 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 have a, a musical gene. I can't dance. And it, it, it's so important that we look to engender positive cultural and creative identities in everybody. And so that we, we and I think that leads on to my, to my second point, I guess. And David was talking about more rigor in research. I think from a research perspective, we've moved beyond now the the desire to try and show these precise cause and effect relationships within cultural engagement. Research technologies and research theory has, has, has moved on now. So we have a whole wealth of possibilities of using video elicitation techniques, neurological techniques, advanced interview techniques to have a holistic picture about what cultural engagement means for people. So I think we've got a, a sort of cultural goal in terms of normalizing creativity. There's a, there's a goal here to use new research me methodologies to understand more about what it means uh, to be engaged in music. And I think, once again, we're at a festival of politics, so we have to emphasise that the political agenda is fundamental. It's all very well us talking about the importance of research, but there are significant challenges politically. I mean, just yesterday, the UK government talked about reducing the number of arts courses in universities for, for, for young people. And we've got to make sure that teaching music, teaching art, teaching all manner of creativity is absolutely embedded in children's earliest experiences of, of, of education. And that's a political question as much as it is a cultural question. I don't know if that was concise enough. but <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Um, um, we have a few questions. In. Um, uh, someone is looking for direct links to some of the um, reports have been mentioned, so that's maybe something that we can gather and distribute after after the the point. Um, lots of people talking about um, good examples already in the NHS, but they tend to, from I'm paraphrasing what's in there because I can't go to every single question now. Um, the the um, long term and chronic conditions it seems to be well understood. Mental health and anxiety conditions well understood, but how how is it feeding into um, sort of other areas of medicine? That are to do with more somatic issues um, is one of the questions, and um, a, a real bit. Um, if we think about those ones, and, and, and really the, the the big one in all of this is a, the response to COVID and the well-being and the mental health of young people in particular, how that might impact. So I'm just going to go around that we're probably going to have just one more time to go through them all. Um, but if I go to um, David first on this one, is, is you know is it a similar picture? in New York to what you think is happening here for young people and the impact of COVID? Uh, absolutely. I, um, you know, it's obviously not the primary population I'm working with, but I know from uh, colleagues who are working in secondary education and university education that there is a, there is a mental health, health crisis as many uh, students are returning to in-person classes, but they're returning uh, really without the tools to navigate the emotional uh, experience that they're having now and the trauma of what's happened over the past 18 months. Um, and we as a society, at least in the U.S., have not been, have not adequately prepared people to deal with the trauma of what's happened. I think we have, we're, we're caught up in the news cycle, we're caught up in the urgency of what's happening, we're caught up in the fear but we haven't we haven't done the other side of that, which is giving young people the tools they need and the community they need to uh, to really build up mental health resiliency and to have an outlet for for challenges that they're experiencing. I think, of course, and I'm biased in this, but I, I think our our other guests would agree that uh, the arts uh, are a significant partner in building resiliency uh, for for mental well-being. Um, for creating the kinds of communities where you can express fears and anxieties um, in, in a safe way, where you can use outlets like music um, and art making and dance to um, work out things that are otherwise very difficult to talk about. So this is all happening at the same time that we're cutting arts education and we're, we're trying to um, scale education to be as Sarah said, the sort of align with the capitalist model. What can my skills earn in the marketplace as opposed to how do we create healthy, engaged, politically conscious young people? 
And so we need to we need to change that dialogue. And I think bringing ensuring that funding arts at uh, the secondary and university level are, is, is maintained and is critical. Um, as we start to see countries like Australia paring back on arts majors in university, that the university is not going to fund, you know, uh, 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 people who are, who are majoring, who are getting a degree in arts. This is, this is insanity as we start to start to look at, you know, how we as a, as a society are dealing with trauma. So I'll, I'll leave it at that, but we have some real, um, self-reflection to do in this as, as policymakers. Yeah. Raymond, do you want to come in since we've, you've gone into the education side of it very quickly? Yeah, no, I, I, I just want to get, uh, echo what, what, what David's saying, that so often in these arguments we are told that there's not enough money or that we have to um, emphasise more important aspects. So I, I guess that the, the argument shouldn't be is there enough money for the arts? We have to prioritise the arts and say, actually, it's not a question of is there enough money. It's move arts up the, 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 the priority level so that it does warrant and it does get the, 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 the finances that we, that, that we need in order to, to, to sustain it. So I think that, that's very important. Also, in terms of coming out of, of, of the pandemic, there's so many examples of where the arts were absolutely crucial for sustaining community. For enhancing community, I think we saw lots of examples of community singing, community um, qu these choirs, and um, people getting together and, and 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 just being together through artistic engagement um, over the over, over 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 the internet. And I think we can take some of those developments and um, keep you know as we move into a sort of hybrid way of being we can keep these these these, these developments that, that we made du during lockdown as a, and integrate them into our, our, our ongoing our ongoing pr practice so I, i'm looking at time so i want to stop talking <laughs> sarah do you want to come in on that question one really quick one um, as, as an example of that, and, and just as you were talking there, Raymond, it came back to me, was I had been following the pandemic from very, very early on on Twitter when it was in Wuhan, as it was kind of coming down through Iran. Nobody was talking about it in terms of our politicians publicly yet. And then there was that moment where very quickly we went into to lockdown. And the moment that I still get goosebumps on my arms thinking about was when the viral, there was some video went viral of them singing Sunshine Over Leith in the banana flats at the bottom of Leith in, in Leith. And to see my community that, you know, um, from that just and through song, how people came together at that absolute moment of, you know, uncertainty, unknowing, not necessarily having great leadership at that point from, from understanding where we're going, but as a community, they came together and expressed that sense of resilience and solidarity for what comes next. And I think those are, you know, that was just a really good example um, of how we deal with this. But I think absolutely, it, it, it's young people, their mental health crisis we have is astounding. It's absolutely the next thing that's going to be happening. We were seeing a mental health crisis in young people before the pandemic. It has simply been, and you add into that their, 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 their sense around the eco what's happening in terms of the ecology, the environment, the collapse of our biodiversity, you know, and, and so those things together, the social impact of social media on our young people. And I think that that is where if we put a really concerted and strategic approach to embedding activity and participation in culture for our young people across policy areas, and how do we join up those policy conversations to, to really come up with innovative solutions um, is, is one of the most critical um, questions we need to get right in the next 18 months. Okay, thank you. I'm just looking to a couple of more of the comments. Um, Jill has asked about, um, the, is there a need for a body or organisation to be leading bringing these things together? Or is it something that in, in, in government level and in, you know, in policy making level, we just have to grasp the thistle in that one, as they would say, and, 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 and make that happen across different areas. And also, um, and I guess this comes back to Sarah's point, you should mentioned a few times about the, the climate and, and what's happening. As we move towards um, what they're talking about is the 15-minute communities and communities where, where arts and, 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 and that culture and everything is embedded 
in our communities, and obviously we have big challenges with the islands and rural communities in Scotland about that participation. Is is, is how how do we ensure that um, you know everyone has access to this going forward? Um, I'll maybe go to Raymond with that one first. Uh, and oh, so how how do we ensure that everyone has 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 a, a access? I, so I, I guess um, thinking about changing or not in changing but in, in enhancing people's sense of the, the, themselves as, as creative creative people i guess there's a an often stated quote from picasso that says every child is an artist the challenge is for them to remain artists through through their through their, their, whole, their whole life and i think you know we want to encourage people to to feel creative and to be creative and to express themselves creatively um so yeah enhancing opportunities making sure that uh, education and our education policy and the educational opportunities of young people includes all types of creative activity and making creative engagement and creative um, activities at the heart of young people's education so that it's seen as just as important as other aspects of their education. So in the last term of the parliament, I was the convener of the Education Skills Committee, so we did the report into music tuition in schools, and uh, which has thankfully been adopted, and, and music tuition is now um, going to be made available and free, free of cost um, ac across Scotland. Um, but I'm very, very struck that a lot of what we've talked about today was the reason why the committee was so unanimous in supporting this, because the young people speaking to us, it, it, for some of them, it was about being artists and going on to the conservatoire and becoming you know, um, professionals in this area, but for most of them, it was about that sense of belonging, uh, an escape, a place to be that they, when they felt stressed, and also the the, the skills that built in in the, the human interaction of being part of a small ensemble or an orchestra. It was the responsibility that came with that, and not letting other people down, and building those life skills. So, absolutely great to hear. So, so that's part of the education. Jigsaw, a lot, lot more still to do, but uh, I'm glad that one's in place. So um, I'm going to go to Sarah again, um, just on those issues. Yeah, no, I think the, the key thing for me, and I'm saying this from an English, um, as somebody who's spent all my life working in Scotland until the last five years, and the thing that is most depressing um, for me within the English system at the moment, despite some really great pieces of activity and work happening, is the obsession with STEM with the STEM subjects, this idea that we can get ourselves out of where we are and all the problems that we have simply by investing in science um, as, 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 and, and technology. And actually, the arts, the creativity piece within that, if we do not understand people and, and, and how they need to learn, and absolutely that, whether it's for the, the small number that may go on and choose to become great artists and theatre makers and you know or fashion designers, designer, your entire you know, you walk around the street, everything is, is visually designed by people with skills and knowledge, expertise. But there's that piece of it, but just as you say, just actually how do I exist in this world right now, which is difficult and hard and anxious inducing, anxiety inducing. So actually that embedding of our of, of creative education across all of our schools. If you if you look at what the private schools are doing, you know it's it's really critical for highly privileged people to have access to the arts. So let's ensure we don't deny it to our, the rest of our children and young people as well. Thank you. And David, did you want to give us a, a little perspective from New York on this? Well, I think we're we're encountering the the, the same challenges in that uh, as the you know the economic forces have come to bear on. Uh, on our young people, there there seems to be less incentive to to study the arts and to engage in the arts, even even as they become ever more important. And I think back to the story of um, of Steve Jobs as as he was had dropped out of Reed College and um, just took a, a calligraphy class, which he then talked about as being one of the most influential kind of experiences in his in his. A professional life because it brought him back to being creative and looking at design uh, from a completely different perspective, which then influenced the designs that he did for um, for Apple. So I think you know we we tend to focus on the immediate uh, goals and and try to try to find solutions to that. And right now that's about uh, that seems to be about STEM. But the really 
I think the successful approach is is really um, you know a steam approach that art is very much part of that because you can't you the the worlds of art and science are much closer than we imagine and scientists need to think creatively um, about problem solving they need to improvise um, they need to look at the world as artists do and so we we have a lot to learn from each other so I, I anything that stylos fields into various points and silos students into um, separate fields is something that, that needs to be questioned and challenged and changed. So uh, the more we can integrate, the more we can bring uh, artistic methods to bear on, on STEM, the better off we're going to be. And the more chance we'll have for solving the really big problems like, like climate change. So as a computer science graduate, I I'm happy to say my, my science hero is Richard Feynman, who was also a brilliant bongo player, and say very much about his bongo playing being very influential to his um, thought processes um, in quantum physics. So, um, yes, absolutely integrated in, indeed. Um, right up against time now, if I could just ask for one sentence just to sum up what you've, you've thought of today, that would be wonderful if you can do it very succinctly. I'll, I'll come to Sarah first, please. <laughs> I was forgetting that I get unmuted there. One sentence. I think for me, there's, I'm just going to mention something that we haven't mentioned yet, and it, it's, it's opened a whole new debate up, or it's part of it, but, but diversity, understanding different perspectives, different cultures, different, and how we build that. I think there's something in within this piece around mental health and, and, and healthy communities and healthy societies and healthy interaction. And I think that that sort of it, it speaks to our needs of, of diversifying our thinking going forward as well. It's just an area we haven't touched on yet, but I'll fall in with that. <laughs> Raymond? So I would say Scotland is world leading in culture. You know, Sarah's been part of a whole generation of artists that have gone on to lead the world musically, artistically, um, theatre, from writing. You know, we, we, we are, Scotland is known across the world. We want to embed that world leading mentality in the whole culture so that everybody shares in this fantastic history and the fantastic present and the fantastic future that we can have for our cultural life in Scotland. David, final thought? Oh, I would argue that the success that Scotland's had is due to the intersection and collaborative nature of your society, that you bring together artists, academics, researchers, scientists, policymakers, politicians to really forge a better path. And it's that spirit of collaboration um, and bringing diverse voices to the table that is the answer to many of the challenges we're going to face now and in, in the future. So collaboration is the key word, and collaboration and partnership uh, that brings many people to the table together. Fantastic. Um, thank you all for your contributions this afternoon and from everyone in the audience who's joined us this afternoon, particularly those who, who, who did put the questions in. We will try and um, get a, a way of getting back with regards to the report, specific reports that have been mentioned this afternoon. Um, it's been an absolute pleasure for me to host this as convener of the committee. Our committee is about to um, publish a report into the first budget inquiry which is about funding for culture in Scotland. And many of the topics that we've talked about this afternoon have been covered in a, that report that we're doing at the moment, which is something else that we can maybe share with the people who joined us this afternoon. But a um, uh, wonderful way to spend a Sunday afternoon. Thank you to everyone. And on that, I'll close this meeting of the Festival of Politics. <laughs>